having an effect across the entire world as we know it, which is a you know something that I think three or four weeks ago we barely saw it coming. So uh, what we hope to do today, I'm going to go through the white paper that we produced over the last couple of weeks. Uh, also, frankly, at the same desk that I'm sitting at now, where I always have the news and CNBC on in the background. And since I started writing the white paper, the stock market was at 26,000. Dow Jones obviously went down to 18,000. And I haven't seen it in the last couple hours today, but it's pushing back up to 24,000. So obviously, if that's an indication of what the Marcus market knows, we really don't know yet what's going to come of this. But we produced the white paper purposefully because I know from my experience in my own club's board during the last recession and during the last recession is when we started club benchmarking. And I know from that experience that far too many clubs made poor decisions as a result. And we're trying like heck to help the industry make sure we don't repeat that. Because I would contend, and I'm going to make this point a number of times, using data, it's not an opinion, that the industry, unfortunately, or a big chunk of the industry, I'm going to say half at least, uh, using Robert Frost's path in the woods, took the wrong path after the last recession, which makes them, that half of the industry, more susceptible to the impact of this likely recession by the way we don't even know if there'll be a recession yet there's an assumption there will be but we don't know so what we're trying to do is is put data and fact-based insight on the table which we don't think existed during the last recession frankly i don't want to sound arrogant but i think we've brought the data to the table for the industry and I think that this data and all of the study and analysis, we've all done together. We can't do it alone. We've only done it with the cooperation of thousand or so clubs consistently since that last recession. But all that work we've done together, and it's a lot of work, trust me, uh, can help us make better decisions this time around. And that's exactly what this webinar is about. So at the top level, I think there's really two important points. The virus crisis is an issue, it's not the issue. And I would contend at this point, it could change, but knowing what we know at this point, it's a tactical issue, not a strategic issue. That's a critical point, which there'll be a thread of that running through the entire webinar. I did a little research, uh, and this is a summary. I got out of college in 1980. It seems like three weeks ago. That's scary. When I graduated, we were in the worst recession at that time. Uh, President Reagan had just been elected and taken office. We were in the worst recession we had been in since the Depression. Unemployment hit nearly 10%, as you see here. And it was a long recession, as you can see here as well. I'm, I'm sorry, it was a quick recession the first time around. The second one, a uh, year later, you know, 22 months combined, we had a definitely had a period there of really negative growth over a, about a two or three year period. And that was following, as we all remember, those of us who were around. A decade of uh, serious inflation in the 70s, which, by the way, is probably in our future this time around. That that inflation had to do with the Vietnam War. This inflation will have to do with the uh, response to the last recession and and the and the response to this you know crisis and the fact that ultimately what's happening is we're printing money. 
But I thought, what the heck? Let's take a look at 40 years, which is 483 months since January of 1980. The country has been in recession 12% of that time. So I'm rounding. 90% of the time, the economy is growing. 10% of the time, 10% of the time, the economy is shrinking. And that'll change, obviously, after we get through this recession. If you look at the, and we have, we have a person, Mike Timmerman, on our staff, who's a very adept at uh, real estate and economic analysis. And he's been keeping us very apprised of the various investment banks and economic prognosticators and the way they view what's happening now. And when you look at that data, there's about 12 banks and economists we've been following. The message also becomes clear that the, the, the uh, estimates for GDP growth are declined in Q2 and Q3 of this year are all over the map, literally. The only thing that comes out of the prognostications for the entire year is that when it's all said and done, if things go the way the market expects, the economists and the prognosticators expect, there'll be a V-shaped recession. And when we start 2021 and look back, we'll probably have seen somewhere between flat growth in 2020 relative to 2019 or a decline of possibly one to 2%, which if you look at this chart, well, this table you can see is a pretty moderate. If it ends up that way, it's going to be considered a moderate or marginal recession. And obviously, it wasn't based on economics, it was based on a medical crisis. We have to keep that in mind. What we're experiencing now is acute, it's we've never experienced it before. There is no pattern we can look to, but you know, personally. In times of stress, times of crisis, I try to tell myself, take a deep breath and think clearly. Probably not going to be as bad as it seems sometime in the future. And that's probably not bad advice for all of us. One of the reasons we decided to put the time and effort into the white paper is based on the number of calls we received as the virus crisis began to really evolve in the middle of March. Personally, I probably talked to, I don't know, 50 to 100 clubs, GMs, board members, et cetera. <clears throat> and I felt through those discussions, almost a sense of panic. And so we created the white paper to try and help mitigate that, frankly, because we don't make good decisions under stress. We, gotta, we have to always keep the big picture in mind. It's tough, but it's necessary. And the big picture, as we go into this crisis, let's say on March 1st, I'm gonna ask a question. What's had more of an impact on your club's current financial position? The 12% of the time the country was in recession in the last 40 years, or the decisions made in the 483 board meetings since 1980. I got a little replication there. I'll contend, having spent 10 years on my club's board and been in front of over 500 other club boards, that the decisions made every month have had a much more profound impact on clubs and the health of this industry. And unfortunately, as a whole, the industry is not healthy. Uh, but those decisions that we made caused the situation that we're in in the industry much more than the minor period of time we were in recession. And I think that in, insight is critical at this juncture. The decisions clubs make during and after this crisis will have a much more profound impact on each club than the crisis itself. And, and during this webinar, I'm gonna hopefully demonstrate using data that exact point. So let's just take a 
step back. Let's look at the way the industry was in February or March. We've gathered data now from over 500 clubs from last year, 2019. You go back to the last three months of 2018, so that 15 month period, we have data in our database from almost a thousand clubs. So this isn't anecdotal, it's not a small sample. This is a significant chunk of the private club industry. If you look at it, you could easily break the industry before the crisis occurred into three buckets. 25% of this industry is shrinking in a critical manner as a result of too few many members and that's directly related to a weak member experience. We, we aren't gonna get into it today, we have in the past, but the data shows very clearly that has everything to do with the lack of breadth of services and amenities and the lack of quality or distinction of services and amenities. The clubs that are shrinking have a pedestrian or lackluster member experience at best. They have weak balance sheets by definition, since they're shrinking, which we're gonna get into in great detail during the webinar. And net worth over time is declining. They have significant deferred capital investment and they have a lack of adequate cash reserves. They embrace operational governance over strategic governance. That's based on experience. And I would suggest there's a culture in the clubs that are having that difficulty where their members think more like customers than owners. 50% of the market is going sideways, meaning flat to some moderate growth. They have a stronger membership engine and a more average balance sheet, but their net worth is still flat uh, to growing slightly in terms of real dollars, inflation invested dollars. They also have deferred capital investment. Our data would indicate three quarters of the clubs in the country have deferred capital. And I wanna say North America, three quarters of clubs in North America have deferred capital investment. Their cash reserves are stronger. You know, there's a whole bunch of this industry, this is half the industry. I'm not gonna paint every club in that half of the industry's bucket, and say they're all operationally governed, but the vast majority are. You know, our view is 90% of the clubs in the country, even those that are successful, some of those that are successful are operationally governed versus strategically governed, which I'll get into at the end. They have a mix of members who think like owners and customers. And then finally, a quarter of the industry is growing purposefully. That's a word that we haven't applied before, but have now. And that's a really important word and concept. Growth is an intentional concept. In business, growth, in business, growth, oh geez, this is a tough one. In business, growth is a conscious decision. It's about strategy, value proposition, and customer experience that's how businesses grow the quarter of the industry that's growing purposefully has done so by choice they have members who think more like owners and take pride in their club they have members who basically have come to an agreement together to say we know what kind of an experience we desire and we're willing to pay for it the focus of governance in these clubs is definitely on making the club better. They're constantly evolving and investing. Their balance sheets are strong. They have net worth that's growing at the upper quartile of the industry. They have assets that are fresh and up to date and they have adequate cash reserves. Sometimes Darwin's statement is confused to say that the strong survive. That's not Darwin's theory. The, the strong don't necessarily survive. Darwin's theory is actually the adaptable species survive. 
It's adaptation that generates survival. And adaptation in the club industry is a critical issue. The 25% of the industry that entered this crisis, crisis strong has adapted to a to changing society. They're strong because they've adapted. The 25% that are shrinking are weak because they have not adapted to a changing society. That's a critical point. And that's a choice. We just don't see the choice as distinctly as we need to in boardrooms around the country. I don't think Terry mentioned this. She may have, but I'll, I'll just say it now. Uh, for those of you who are on the webinar who are familiar with the way we operate, we're very happy to, I'd prefer to, frankly, uh, take questions in real time. So if anyone has any questions, just move into your chat pane, throw the question in, and Terry will uh, stop me, and I'll answer the question in real time. So that's some backdrop and context that sets up our white paper and this webinar. And then that is what allows us to conceive of the framework we have conceived of in which we're now communicating. And that framework has some tenants. The first one is this, and I can't tell you right now how many clubs I've spoken with as recently as today, but over the last week or two, where I see them making decisions right now in the middle of this crisis that will inevitably have long-term consequences. That's a faux pas. We don't want to do that. We don't, for example, want to be cutting the initiation fee in the, of the club while we're in the shutdown, anticipating when we come out of it, we'll either get more members or need more members. We don't want to be now hacking into our 2020 operating and capital budgets. I'll explain why in a minute, expecting doomsday. I'm, my pattern so far is it's the weak clubs that are going to do that and are thinking about doing that. And frankly, it's because of their culture of operational governance. We can't do that right now. We can't do a damn thing except absorb and consider absorbing the impact of the shutdown until the end of April or middle of May. When we have more information, we have no information right now. Nobody knows. The market's swinging up and down. It's up today. It was up yesterday. It was down last week. Goldman Sachs chief equity strategist just came out today and said, don't think because of the market bounce that we've hit the bottom. And don't think we've solved the virus crisis. We don't know. Let's just take a breath, wait the 30 days out like we're all doing at home, and not panic. Don't hack into the budgets expecting doomsday. It makes no sense to me, at least, whatsoever. That's point one. Point two, when we're making any decisions about our club, it sure as heck seems to me that we should be making them within the context of which bucket of these three buckets our club is in. Are we in the red bucket, the yellow bucket, or the green bucket? How could we possibly make decisions without understanding that? The clubs that are, that are weak are weak for a reason. And that has to be considered as we consider how to address this crisis in, in emerging from it. Point three is obvious, but needs to be stated. The stronger the balance sheet of any business or any family, the better able it is to absorb the impact of the shutdown. The clubs with the weak balance sheets are less able to. I know. One club already in Massachusetts that closed its doors since we had the shutdown. I'm sure there's going to be more. It's a bit of the thinning of the herd, to be frank. But you know, my view is we want to preserve as many clubs as we can. We don't want to lose clubs. We don't want the industry to shrink. It might make some clubs healthier. A point I hope to make during this webinar is there's such a difference in the club world 
than there is in the, let's say, for-profit business world. One of the points I hope to draw out today is that clubs to a much greater degree control their own destiny than we do in the typical for-profit market environment. And I'll get into that later as to why that is the case, but it is the case. So with that as a backdrop, we suggest that clubs consider what's going on through the rest of 2020 in three time periods. Until we reopen somewhere at the end of April to mid-May, depending on obviously where we are, what part of the country, how significant the virus was there. Then the period of May to June, and then July through the rest of the year. So we're going to walk through those three time periods as we did in the white paper. So through the end of April. Ray, do you want to take a couple quick questions before you start? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Please. Um, Ray says board should stay away from the, the A word right now. Does that mean assessment? The answer to that is yes. Uh, this one is, we're beginning to see a few members ask for breaks on dues and other capital fees. Their financial situations are uncertain. How should a club respond? Okay, I, I, don't, I don't think, unless it's necessary, unless the club is in a cash crisis, I don't think it's wise to have an assessment while the club is shut down. We don't believe in having them when the club is open and strong. We're not believers in assessments. We think assessments, and I'm gonna get into this in some detail later, are a manifestation of poor capital planning. They're a thing of the past. We're working our butts off to get rid of them, frankly, right across the industry. So I definitely would advise against doing that during the shutdown. As to the second question, we'll address some of that now. But I also would suggest that it's not wise to have dues holidays for the membership. We need the dues revenue, to keep the club liquid. Now, if there's certain members, obviously some of our members are gonna be impacted more than others uh, as a result of the crisis. Some of them may not even be working. Some of them may have been laid off. Anyone who desires to, to remain in a club who's having short-term financial turmoil as a result of their own situation, I always thought clubs should work closely with those members who really want to stay in the club but have a cash crunch. Most clubs charge interest on overdue bills. That interest is more than the interest they get in the bank. Long member inevitably pays. What the heck's wrong with helping club members through these? That's what a club's about, social organization. It's an organization where we're supposed to feel as brothers and sisters. So why wouldn't we try to help members through that? But that doesn't mean a wholesale dues holiday for every member of the club. We're all, anyone who belongs to a club right now is paying dues and not using the club. I mean, I know there's some clubs that are still with golfers occurring, which I think is a debacle if you ask me. It's horrible. Clubs already have been painted with the 1% the arrogance paintbrush. How the hell does it look when people who have restaurants that are closed or work in restaurants that are closed are driving by a club where rich people are playing golf? Not good, not a good image. So I'm sorry, that's a little bit of an emotional issue for me. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I think that while we're closed, through the end of April, middle of May, obviously what's gonna happen is there's not gonna be any dues revenue, a non-dues revenue, or very little, essentially none. <clears throat> uh, the members aren't in the club. I know there's so many managers that I've spoken with who are so creative, they work so hard that they and their teams to try and keep members engaged during the shutdown. Kudos to everyone doing that. I've seen really some creative stuff, I'm sure that those managers are happy to share and managers I'm sure are all networking and what they're doing. That's a great thing. The biggest decision during the shutdown, let's face it, and most of the clubs, you know, now that we're on the webinar and it's April 6th or 7th, whatever it is, 7th, uh, most clubs have already made the decisions. 
But the biggest decision is what do you do with the staff during the shutdown? Are we going to pay the staff or not? Based on surveys we have been seeing earlier in the crisis, my sense was in the end, it's probably going to be a third, a third, a third. A third likely will. A third likely will for a determined period of time. And a third will lay off a furlough a large chunk of the staff. One of the things that transpired uh, with the CARES Act as we were writing the white paper and considering this, and I'm sure we're all familiar with it, is one of the tenets of the CARES Act was the fact that the folks who are unemployment are uh, able to garner through the federal government $600 more per, more per week than what their calculated uh, unemployment earnings would have been. So it might actually be better for some staff to be furloughed. I didn't realize, by the way, until yesterday uh, that there's a difference between a layoff and a furlough. I learned something. I love it. I love learning. That's another story. But uh, but it might make sense, given that tenant in the unemployment uh, response, that some of the staff would prefer to be on unemployment because they're going to make more money. Of course, the, the balancing act there is assuring they're available when the club reopens, assuring the club can scale back up operationally quickly, et cetera. Uh, in this period of time, keep the decisions, please, anchored to the impact of the shutdown. It's a short-term issue. It needs short-term solutions that have short-term consequences. We don't need to be mitigating the effects of the six or eight week shutdown by making long-term decisions. We did some analysis. Uh, we looked at the median club with golf and without golf. We always have to consider the two different market segments because they are different. Uh, and our estimate, and I'm not gonna get into all the details of it, I did in the white paper. Uh, our estimate is a four week shutdown at the median club, which has uh, with golf, which has 7.7 .7 million in operating revenue last year, would be $140,000. And at the median club without golf, which has 5.1 million in operating revenue, would be $90,000. Uh, if your club has more or less revenue, you can simply prorate that. I did do some analysis. It's not going to be exact. It's just going to give you a frame of reference. It's so funny now because of the clubs I've been asking when I asked or talking with, when I asked them what the effect is, come to this metric at the bottom, which is the four week shutdown. The effect ultimately is probably between three and a half and four and a half percent of dues revenue. As you can see at the bottom of the spreadsheet with the analysis, which it equate to about 300 bucks per member in a club with golf. 150 per member in a club with alcohol. If it's an eight week shutdown, double it, seven to 9% of dues revenue. But there's a key point with that data. Every club is gonna do their own analysis, I'm quite sure of that. But all clubs, I contend, will arrive at a similar point. The shutdown impact financially is marginal. Even if you said it's 10% of the annual dues revenue with the club, not sneezing at the 10%, but it's marginal. It's a tactical issue. It's not a fundamental strategic issue. We can deal with it. Now, shifting a bit, because it's important, in the calls I've had since the meltdown started, I'm just going to say three. I've been on the phone with clubs, one club that has that dues to revenue ratio, dues to operating revenue ratio of 15%. One that has a dues to revenue ratio of 28%, and one that has a dues to revenue ratio of 30%. That's what now we have come to realize with a little bit of hindsight, frankly. We always zeroed in, as everyone who follows us knows, on the dues to operating revenue ratio. It's the, frankly, first ratio I discovered in 2011, writing the uh, finance and operations report for CMAA in those days. I zeroed in on that ratio and noticed that there was a profound impact uh, of success, financial success across the spectrum. Clubs with low ratios tend to be less healthy. Clubs with higher ratios 
tend to be more healthy. So we've applied some words now based on this crisis to, to summarize that. You can see the metrics here with golf and without golf. One of the big differences, in fact, the major difference between the two market segments is that clubs without golf have a lower dues to revenue ratio than clubs with golf. And they can do that because they don't have to maintain a golf course, which is the most expensive department in a club with golf. So we say any club in the uh, lower quartile, so 25% of the industry, we would characterize as having a leveraged operating model. In clubs with golf, that means that the dues to revenue ratio is less than 45. In clubs without golf, it's less than 40. Half the industry with golf between 45 and 55% ratio and without golf, 40 to 50. And then the upper quartile, which we would refer to as a dues centric operating model, uh, over 55% in clubs with golf and over 50% in clubs without golf. That 5% differential uh, market segments is persistent since the gathering data, very consistent for the year. Obviously, clubs that have a leveraged operating model are going to have a much more significant impact or a more significant, depending on where that ratio falls, they'll have a more significant impact uh, as a result of the shutdown because they rely more on new dues, non-dues revenue. Clubs with a dues-centric operating model will have a less significant impact. So it's something to consider uh, as you make decisions. But our view of this is, and we wouldn't really have seen this. We didn't get there, frankly. We have done a lot of work on it, but we hadn't finished it. But we have been anticipating a recession now. I think anyone who follows this as well would hear this, and we'll hear it more during the webinar. Uh, we've been anticipating the market during town. It's obvious that the that economy isn't going to expand ad infinitum. So we've been doing things to prepare. One of the things we were considering is a stress test. Ironically, it would have been more of a balance sheet stress test than a income statement stress test. And ironically, this downturn is, or this crisis, I should say, is really an income statement uh, stress point. So it's going to have more of an impact based on the operating model, uh, ultimately. Although in the end, and we'll see this not as a whole brush, but generally speaking, the clubs with leveraged operating models are the clubs that have weak balance sheets as well. They're also the clubs that have a leveraged operating model for a reason, which is they do it to try and keep dues low and or to account for not having enough members. Whereas the clubs with the do-centric operating model tend to be the clubs where the board and the membership and the staff are all aligned around delivering an experience the membership desires with the membership thinking behind the scenes that we're willing to pay for that experience that we desire. There's a few other tactical issues through the end of April. Um, one of them is, you know, someone had already asked this question. We don't think dues holidays make sense. Resist the temptation. Those members of clubs who agonize over paying the club when they're not using the club for the six or eight week or four or eight week period, they're thinking more like customers than owners. We own the damn club. We have to fund it, obviously. We can't close the club and lay off the, the staff and get a new staff when we start up in six weeks or four weeks. It makes no sense. Now, certain clubs, especially city athletic clubs, uh, may have a base dues supplemented by ancillary dues, like most of the members, all the members pay the base dues, and a smaller proportion of the membership, maybe 20% or something, might pay some athletic dues. Some of those clubs I know, I've spoken with too, uh, may have relaxed those supplemental dues while the club's closed because people can't use the athletic facilities. I don't think that's unwise. I think every club can use common sense in such cases, and it's not going to wipe out a substantial portion of the dues revenue anyway. So obviously, we can't, you know, use data to address, address in a in a mass 
communication man at every single club's issues, but common sense can prevail. And then on a broad basis, while we're not using the F and B, or we can't use the F and B operation, you know, relaxing and suspending the F and B minimum is a as a way to acknowledge, yeah, hey, we're all in this together. That's fine. It's going to have a marginal financial impact in anyway. If clubs want to do it, do it. But don't do it without quantifying exactly what the impact is. At the median unspent food and beverage unspent minimum is twenty-five thousand dollars at the median club. So it's very marginal. So that's us through April. Again, short-term crisis. Very few, very little information. Nobody knows where we're heading. Let's bound the time frame. Let's make short-term decisions, tactical decisions. Let's deal with it tactically. Let's not panic. Let's not go hacking and slashing. Let's just get through the shutdown, take a deep breath, and then we'll see where we're at, okay? That's section one. Do you wanna do some questions, Ray? Yes, please. Okay, first question. Do you recommend making decisions based on the bucket you're in or the bucket you want to be in? Ah, that's a great question. Well, whoever asked that question is thinking along the lines of what we are thinking. We can't make any decisions without recognizing which bucket we're in, but we should always make decisions striving to make sure we're in the right bucket. And if we make poor decisions, we're going to end up in the wrong bucket. It's that simple. So I would answer it specifically to say, make the decisions. First off, know exactly which of these three buckets you're in. And then when you're making decisions in this short term period, make sure you don't make decisions that either force you to stay in that bucket or make the chances of getting out of it greater. It's in the end, it's all about member experience. And the data that we have is going to demonstrate that here. Um, okay. So we want to make decisions with that in mind. Okay, next question. Some capital projects are hard to execute with members around. If we are capable of executing some of these projects while the club is closed, isn't that a good thing to do? Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely, 100%. The thing that gets me nervous is when I hear the opposite. I've actually spoken with a few clubs where they are thinking they're gonna stop capital investments that they had on the horizon. They're just gonna not do them in 2020. I don't know if that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. I'll let them make their own decisions, obviously. I sure as hell wouldn't be making that decision out of the crisis. Why would we force that decision? I'd be more on the bucket of the question point, which is if we've got the money, and we're gonna do the project, there's no members around, let's get it done now instead of while they're around. Makes sense to me. Someone else asked, how would you define adequate cash reserves? And you may have already answered that. Well, uh, I haven't answered it, but it's a great question too. The median club has cash entering this crisis at the end of 2019. The median club, and it's consistent by the way, also year in and year out. The median club has cash that equates to 15% of operating revenue. That amount of cash does not have any capital reserves in it. Clubs that are at the median do not have capital reserves in hand, meaning reserves capital investments. So one of the things we're going to talk about today and we've really focused our company on is make sure, and we've done a lot of analysis, and we're not going to talk about it in detail today, but we've got people on our team who are experts. We've done a whole bunch of analysis as to try to quantify to the question's point, what is the amount of cash take? And that'll be something we end the webinar with. It's all about the forward-looking capital plan. The answer to that question specifically is clubs must have an adequate amount of cash on hand to assure they can meet their upcoming capital needs. 
we believe clubs should have a 10 year horizon in their capital forward looking capital plan model. And the cash that we enter any of the years in that, it's a rolling 10 year model, is the amount we need to meet the needs coming forward. It can fluctuate year to year, but that is the answer to that question. But I can tell you this, if clubs had that adequate amount of cash, it would be more than 15% of operating revenue. My sense is that clubs, about a quarter of the clubs in the country have some money capital for capital investment. Those clubs have to have, I'm doing this off the, I believe the 75th percentile uh, for cash operating revenue is about 22%. That's off the top of my head. Uh, so I'd say that percentage in a, our clubs that actually have a substantive capital uh, reserve on here as well. So any other questions, Terry? Lots, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think you just covered this. We'll do a few and then um, anything we don't get to during the session, we have saved and we'll reply by email, okay? Uh, when you say 15% cash to operating revenue, is this unrestricted cash or both reserve cash and unrestricted cash? Both. Okay, if a club is currently in the middle of a golf course renovation, paid by member assessment spread out over two years, would it make sense to suspend the project for one year to assist members with cash flow? It's a very specific question. Happy to have a discussion with or ask specifically my instinctual answer without knowing all of the circumstances is no. Okay, um, yeah, there's a couple that are like that that are pretty spe case specific. So we'll take, we'll do those by, by email or phone later. Uh, someone okay. asked, how do you entice a club with a customer culture to make decisions like owners? Education. And that is the third phase of this, our framework for responding to the crisis. We are, so believe with believers, I, you know, Rahm Emanuel said it during the meltdown in uh, 07 and 08, chief of staff of President Obama, the crisis is too good an opportunity to waste. Well, if we have members who think like customers, we probably have a weak balance sheet. We have probably a cost centric uh, approach and an additional approach to governance. Let's use this crisis as an opportunity to illuminate what bucket we're in crisis in, how we are there and how we get it from red or yellow to green. All right, so the next is, this is where it gets very, to my mind, it, 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 we're moving tactical to strategic we're moving from little or no information to much clearer situation as regards the virus. Um, so we have more data, we have more information, we have more knowledge. And we're gonna see where we're at. So I wrote the white paper, for, it took me a week, but I was writing heavily on March 19th and the market was gyrating wildly. And as I said, it's gone from 26,018 and back to 24 or so in this period, in a two week period. I had, in my own head, thought this. And I believe that ultimately the industry, I got an email from, read the white paper, was fast back. A uh, club I, we've done some work with, one of the I'm going to I'm going to modify this slightly as a result, but our thought is that ultimately to belong the largest liquid assets that are invested is the term long term, but you know something like that. I just don't like, it. but the the we all feel it. We all feel it. 401k vibe, so to speak. We all feel 
the ups and downs of the market through a 401k. So it's more of a wealth effect. Now is that, and the markets have gone back to let's say 24,000 or above when we get out of this shutdown. I don't think, you know, some people may have lost their jobs. That's a tragedy, obviously. But for the most part, if people still have the job, they've been working at home, the Dow's come back up. Yeah, it's taken a dip decline, but shit, it's been up, you know, record level. I don't know that it's going to be a, a crisis in the industry or in any industry. So we're going to either emerge from the shutdown quickly. And if we do emerge quickly, I'm, you know, I don't know. I'm not a stock market. Right. Can you hang on a minute? You, your sound is breaking up really badly for a lot of people. Okay. Are you on a phone or are you on computer audio? Well, I'm on a computer audio, but I may go to the phone right now because I don't want that to. Uh... So just give me a second because if I, you know, sometimes in the neighborhood, the way people are uh, working from home, we have bandwidth issues. So let me just get the, the phone number. Are you there? Yes. Okay. Is that better? Much. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the phone, folks. I'm sorry about that. I'm guessing that's bandwidth in the neighborhood. Uh, so we're either gonna be emerging quickly or slowly. If it's quickly, you know, we're probably not gonna have a catastrophic situation. If it's slowly, it could get it could get tough, and it definitely could start to uh, evolve from a tactical issue short term to a more strategic issue longer term. We don't know which one it is. We'll know in May or June. We believe that the key data that we need to watch in both scenarios is the same. First off, we'll know which scenario we're in. There'll be no ambiguity which one we're in. All we have to do is watch TV. But but the key in this period is you have to, we believe, you have to understand where your membership engine is. We're going to get into that, what the strength of it is entering the crisis. And then we have to watch like a hawk uh, the membership trends, not only in our own club, but in relation to our local market and the industry at large. So evaluating and understanding the membership engine, we can, you know, there's this three bucket three kind of cuts through everything. There's three buckets. Certain clubs have a strong membership engine. I'll tell you, we've been gathering data from about 160 clubs for the last year. And we've made every effort, every month we gather the data, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. We've made every effort to make that group of clubs a cross-section of the entire industry. We think we've done that. 25% of that 160 clubs have a wait list. So the industry, quote-unquote, previously thought, quote-unquote, without any data, by the way, that we might have wait lists in clubs that are less than 10%. I'm not sure, and I bought that. After studying the data we've been aggregating, I'm not convinced anymore. I actually believe 20 to 25% of the clubs in the industry do have a wait list. And by the way, isn't it sad that we don't actually know? We're trying to change that. We have to change that. So if you have a wait list, you're close to full, whatever it might be, your initiation fee is going to reflect it because you're going to be in the upper quartile uh, in terms of initiation fee. And clubs with golf, that have put you to, we'll get into this in a minute, about 50 grand, I'm rounding, and in clubs without golf, it's in the 20 grand range. So those clubs obviously have a strong membership engine. That's about a quarter of the market. The clubs that have a moderate membership engine have enough members to adequately or near adequately fund operations and capital. They have initiation fees that range between the 25th and 75th percentiles of their respective segments with or without golf, but they don't have a waiting list. That doesn't mean they're in trouble. And depending on where you fall on that spectrum, you could be just on the verge of a waiting list, or you could be very far from it. So depending on where you fall on that spectrum, obviously the strength of moderation is a bit different. 
And then finally, there's about a quarter of the industry, which we've seen already, these red bucket clubs that do not have enough members to fund operations and capital. They're the lower quartile in terms of initiation fees. That goes hand in hand. And they have a weak balance sheet. That's 25% of the market. In the white paper, we put the uh, total member counts and the full member equivalent equivalents at the median for the last three years, including 19, because we have that data. Uh, as you can see, it's been really, really consistent over the last three years in both market segments. So the, we've been tracking it enough with the strategic monthly dashboard and the annual data. We know where the, where the industry's at. The, it falls into those three buckets. So here we have clubs looking at the initiation fee as a way to understand the strength or weakness of the engine. This is also for 2019. A quarter of the clubs have an initiation fee under 10, and a quarter have an initiation. This is with golf. We'll get into with out golf in a minute. And a quarter of the clubs have an initiation fee of 67 or over. The median's 30. That median a few years back was 25. The 25th percentile a few years back was 7,500, and the 75th percentile a few years back was 50. There's no question during the economic expansion we've enjoyed since 07, 08, 09, that initiation fees have gradually uh, come up in the industry. But there's something, I'm speaking now mainly not to the strong engine clubs, to the weak and moderate engine clubs. It's really, really important those clubs embrace this data and this message. I can't tell you how many clubs I've worked with where the belief is if we need more members, we should cut the initiation fee and we'll get more members. The data has never supported that thesis. I would contend respectfully that that thesis is absolutely wrong and the data we see right here demonstrates it. The clubs with the lowest initiation fees, the lower quartile at the median have 393 full member equivalents. At the higher two quartiles, it's somewhere between over 500 full member equivalents. Well, if a lower initiation fee gave you more members, the clubs with the lowest initiation fees would have more members, but they don't. They never have. They're never going to. One of the points we're going to make at the end, and I got to start picking the pace up probably because uh, I'm getting a little too into this. I know there's so much to come, but clubs don't compete on price. There's a lot of industries that don't compete on price. Does Rolex? sell watches based on price? Does Mercedes sell automobiles based on price? Clubs do not compete on price. They compete on value. We can't succeed as a club by lowering our price. We only will succeed by increasing the value we deliver for a given price. Look at the F&B subsidy. Another trap, which I'm not, I've talked about that. We've talked about that for years now. We don't have to beat the horse, but it shows the same story. Look at the amount of money invested in non-golf sports across that spectrum, which ultimately represents the breadth of services and amenities. And here's the key point, because we're going to hammer on this. Look at the members' equity in the clubs, how it grows dramatically as the initiation fee increases. and it's. Not because the clubs, the, the members' equity isn't growing because of the higher initiation fee. It's that the initiation fee is a result of a compelling member experience and having the right amount of members. And that is what grows member equity. The initiation fee is a quantitative measure of the members' experience. There is no better marker for a club than the initiation fee because it literally represents intersection of supply and demand for your club. And you see the spectrum here, if you have golf, you know which bucket you're falling into. You're in the lower quartile, you have a, a weak membership engine. You're in the upper quartile, you have a strong membership engine. You're between the 25th and 75th, you're going from weak to strong, and you're in the moderate bucket. It's that simple. There's one more metric here, which we'll talk about in a minute. The net to gross property plant and equipment ratio, which represents how depreciated the asset base of the club is. You can see it tracks as well, right along with members' equity, 
just as we would expect it to. After the last meltdown, 09, our estimate is half the industry tweaked their initiation fee the wrong way. They lowered it or cut it or eliminated it. Those are the clubs that have seen their net worth decline since 09. Half the industry. We cannot repeat that this time around. Here we go with clubs without golf. It's the same pattern. Higher initiation fee, more members, not less members. Higher subsidies of F&B. Broader services and amenities. More members equity. And a net to gross PP&E ratio that reflects it. Clubs will not garner more members by cutting their initiation fee or eliminating it. It's a faux pas. We can't fix a bad experience by changing the price. By the way, another point, I want to make this clear. The strength of your membership engine as it is at the moment is not a result of this crisis. It's a result of what happened in the boardroom at the club since 09's recession. And then one more point on this. And these are things we have to consider in the May June timeframe. Is that this shows that churn decreases dramatically. This is for all uh, clubs with golf. Churn de decreases dramatically as the initiation fee increases. So the clubs with the lowest churn, the median initiation fee is 50 grand. The clubs with the highest churn, it's 10 grand. Obviously, it's all about skin in the game. And by the way, when we lower the initiation fee or cut it or eliminate it, are we likely, more likely to attract customers or owners? Are we more likely to attract people who are buying into a culture, a, a social network, a tradition, a legacy, who are willing to fund the club? Are we more will, buying into members, bringing in members who are going to shirk that responsibility? The answer is obvious. They think like customers, not owners, if they pay a lower initiation fee or if they're searching to pay a lower initiation fee. The churn also exists in clubs with alcohol. It's the same exact pattern. Right. So can all you, we do- Can but, you explain churn real quickly? Someone asked if you would explain churn for, yeah. for board members that are on. Fair enough. The way we measure it, it's a very specific way. We may change it in the future, but the way we've been measuring it for 11 years is this. We look at the full membership category, and we look at the number of full members that either exited or downgraded in a given year as a percentage of the total uh, full members at the end of that year. So in a club that has 10% churn, that would mean they need to replace their entire full membership every 10 years. A club that has 4% churn is gonna replace it every 25 years, stock difference. A quarter of the industry, as you can see, as a 10% churn. That's not good. Those are the red bucket clubs. As we're considering this in the May, June timeframe, the thing that we have to keep in mind is this. And this is another critical point that we've begun to do a lot of research on. I'm gonna show some of this later. I, we, we get so, at times, wrapped around the axle thinking every industry is the same and every industry is a, is a is, succeeds or a, a fails based on managing costs. It's not true. Many industries succeed or fail based on the value they deliver, not the cost that they sell something for. The club industry is one. The club industry is a high fixed cost industry, period. There are very few variable costs in the club industry. It's not about being efficient. It's about offering the right value proposition. What we need to do if we're on the board of a club or we're senior staff in a club, is we have to embrace this concept. Every club has a footprint. This club that I've shown has an extensive footprint. I always put this up in board presentations and say, you think this club's doing well or not doing well? Most clubs would kill for one of those resort-style pools. They have three right next to each other. But the point is this, it's the footprint and the scale and size of the footprint and the member experience that drives the costs. 
And the whole trick in the club industry is assuring we have the adequate number of members and we charge them the right amount of money to properly fund the footprint. After the last recession, and pray to, I pray to God, we don't have this happen in this industry after this crisis. Half of the industry from our data went into a cost-cutting mode. They weren't focused on delivering a member experience and growing the footprint. They were focused on maintaining the footprint or shrinking it, literally cutting the cost. That doesn't work. It won't work. In clubs that saw after the last recession a decline in membership for whatever reason, those are the clubs that tended to cut costs thinking they're going to attract our initiation fees, thinking they'll bring in more members. It doesn't work. What we needed to do and what some clubs did, and I'm, I belong to one of them, frankly, is we increased the amount we were paying as members to make up for fewer members. So we kept funding the prop as, to the greatest degree we could. We kept funding the footprint properly. If you go a decade and you're cutting corners on funding the footprint, or we're cutting corners on funding the footprint, where are we going to end up after 10 years? We're going to end up with a dilapidated asset base, with a member experience that's anemic at best, and it's not because of anything other than we made the wrong decision. If we keep investing properly in the in the footprint, the member experience and the capital, we'll have a better chance of garnering the members we need. If we cut everything, we will not succeed over time. All we're doing is causing a eventual decline into closing the doors. So the way we characterize this in the white paper, and we, the way we thought about it from nearly day one is this. We have to embrace the concept that we have to have whatever our number of members are, we got to charge them the right amount of money to fund the footprint properly on both a capital, a capital and operating basis. And we can't, I mean, on the margin, certainly we can make up for a deficiency of members or a, or a deficiency in how much we charge members through non-dues revenue. But we know, we've already seen, that defines a leveraged operating model. And we're seeing right now a really severe example of how that model, that op leveraged model is suspect or susceptible to problems. It doesn't have to be a virus, by the way. The clubs that have a leveraged operating model, I'll use a club as an example, use your clubs and golf clubs with golf. If you have a hugely rainy peak season, and you have a highly leveraged operating model relying on outside banquets or outside outing, uh, golf outings, et cetera, you're not going to meet your budget. So it, it's just something to consider. We have to embrace the concept of understanding the model. And then finally, and this, you know, when we do webinars, we're not selling, I'm selling, I'm not selling anything right now. I'm trying to give something away. Okay. It's foresight. Usually, I, you know, one of, I think, my own weaknesses is I try not to be bold, but I'm going to be bold for a moment. We did a webinar on this at the beginning of March before the crisis or the virus was really on our radar screen, anyone's radar screen. We created a service for the industry called the Strategic Monthly Dashboard. It's a free service. It allows clubs to evaluate the membership numbers, the cost of belonging, the initiation fee, and the high-level financial trends on a monthly basis. It gives every club the ability to peer into the state of the market in near real time. We didn't create it thinking there was a virus coming. We've been working on it for three or four years. We got 160 clubs coming into this participating, and we've already got over 200 that now said they will. This is the vehicle that will allow us as an industry to understand the impact of the virus. We are, I'm pleading with, we, we've got over 500 participants in this webinar. I'm pleading with everyone. If you're not participating, or if you did and you stopped, start or begin to, because this is the data we need in May and June. Otherwise, we don't know what's going on in the industry. These one-off surveys, 
sending emails to you, the GMs down the street, you know, uh, the, the snap survey from somewhere. That's not the way to run a business. We need this data constantly and consistently. How the hell do we compete in the market when we don't really understand what's going on in the market on a regular basis? We can only do it in our fragmented market if clubs participate. It's simple. It's 20 minutes of work a month. It's easy. Please. You see the web address below? If you participate, you'll have the data. You'll be right on the front line. In the May SMD report, we'll know what happened in March. And we'll, in the June one, we'll know what happened in May, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, April, and on and on. So this is it. This is the way to get market visibility. Please. Okay. One more point in the May-June time frame. You know, it's really, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We've all heard the statement. We've, we're presenting data. We're doing this as a service to the industry. We wrote the white paper to try like heck to make sure we don't repeat the mistakes from the 2009 recession. I'm going to take a few minutes and I'm going to read this paragraph. When Terry, Terry is a great editor and someone who was great to work with as an editor, and when we were going through the white paper before we released it, we were reading it together, and I, I saw this paragraph, and I said, this is it. This is the point of the whole white paper, ultimately. If I was going to take one paragraph out of it, it would be this one. So I said, for the webinar, let's take it out of it. I'm going to read it. It is imperative. Clubs make decisions always, by the way, not just during the crisis, within the context of the strength of their membership engine. Each club must recognize that the strength or weakness of their membership engine in the present moment is the outcome of decisions made since the last recession. We have seen clubs change the strength of their membership engine over that period of time. Certain clubs that came out of the last recession with the moderate strength engine now have a strong engine. Some clubs that had strong engines coming out of the last recession now have weak or moderate engines. Those shifts are directly related to decisions that were made in the boardroom over the last decade. Decisions made in reaction to this short-term crisis during the coming months will have a much more lasting and profound impact on your club's future than the crisis itself did. That's why we need data. That's why we need to understand what the best practices are financially in a club. If we don't, we are success, uh, likely to make poor decisions. And I'm not waving my arms. This isn't an emotional thing. The data demonstrates this happened after 09. Okay, so now we know. First period, short-term, tactical all about managing the financial impact of the shutdown. Second period, May and June, all about understanding what's happening in the market, all about understanding the extent of the longer term or lack thereof impact of the virus, and all about monitoring what's going on in the market and our own club in terms of membership intake and uh, attrition. Now we're into July. Hopefully, we're doing well as a society. Hopefully, we're back to normal. One of my daughters asked last night, hey, Dad, do you think by July 4th things will be normal again? I don't know if they'll be exactly normal, but my guess is there'll be a lot of July 4th celebrations across the country, just like there were last year. Maybe we won't shake as many hands. Maybe we'll stand a little further apart from each other. Maybe we won't drink out of each other's drinks. But society and the economy will probably be back on track. So what do we do now? We've come out of the crisis. We've absorbed the financial impact. We've assessed our engine, a membership engine, and its strength or lack thereof. Here's what we have to do. We have to understand how our member experience, is it compelling enough to drive a strong membership engine? Do we understand and embrace the best financial practices? 
is our net worth increasing over time and are we aggregating the capital necessary to meet the future? Those two things go hand in hand. Do we embrace data-driven leadership? Are we still steered by the loudest voice in the room? And do we have a membership culture of owners or customers? A couple of quick points. I heard Frank Maiden see this uh, on a webinar recently. It's a great statement. It's only when the tide goes out that you learn who has been swimming naked. That's Warren Buffett. Well, that equates, we, we've said at Club Benchmark, and Jim Butler is, is very keen and is a very insightful thought. We employ a variation of that observation, which is over time, the market will expose weak business or financial models. That's what we're seeing here. So as b things begin to return to normal, we should actually be grateful in some way to have seen our model under stress because that gives us more insight. And if we do consider things from that vantage point, then what we're doing is we're reacting strategically to a tactical stimulus. That's exactly what we want to do. So let's use the crisis as an opportunity, as Rahm Emanuel said, to change the future. And there's only one way every year, every, every new year's worth of data that we garner at club benchmarking, and frankly, I dig into in earnest, it just cements what we've learned. And there are financial best practices. These are they. I'm being bold again. I don't believe these concepts were enunciated before we came into existence. They're enunciated now, not because just because of us, but because of our community, including all the clubs on this phone, on this webinar, including all the clubs we've worked with. It's been a it's been a, a grueling amount of work. This didn't just fall out of the sky. But this is a data driven view of what financial best practices are in the club industry. And I'm going to go through each of them. I'm not going to read all five points now. I'll just dive in. Some of this you've seen before. It's okay. Until it actually makes a difference in the boardroom of each club, until each club embraces the concept, frankly, we haven't seen it enough. These concepts are tried and tested over a long period of time. They've just been discovered recently. We discovered them in the last decade, but they've existed for a long time, waiting to be discovered. We're very grateful we had the opportunity to discover them. The first one is this. The income statement, 90% of the clubs in the country set the operating ledger or income statement, I use the term, terms anonymously, to break even, excluding depreciation. The data supports that premise. The blue line on this chart is the operating result. It's 2019 data again. The median club, and this is both clubs with and without golf, we've just combined them both. The median club had an operating margin of 1% of the operating revenue. By definition, that's break even. At club benchmarking, we say anything between minus four and plus 4% of an operating margin is essentially break even. 70% of the clubs, as outlined on the chart, are hovering around break-even. Yeah, there's a few clubs that generate a more significant surplus, and there's definitely a few clubs that have a significant operating deficit. But 70% are hovering around break-even just as they plan to. The club industry has proven for 100 or more years it's really good at meeting budgets. The, the, the gold line is to put into context the, so by definition, sorry, by definition, break even is not a financial driver. What we've learned is that the income statement operating ledger, even though most of the money runs through it, is literally consumed year in and year out by members enjoying the club. It does not produce a financial outcome. It's not intended to and it never will. The financial driver is capital income, and we put capital income on this chart into the same context as the operating result. We just took the capital income and uh, assessed it in relation to operating revenue. So that median club that had a 1% operating margin had capital income equivalent to 13% of its operating revenue. 
That's the pile of cash. That's the money a club has to drive itself forward financially. It doesn't have the operating money. That was consumed by members enjoying the club. It is every year. The capital is the money that will propel a club forward financially. We can assess using what we call the net available capital ratio, the strength of a given club's capital engine. And what net available capital is, is the amount of money left at the end of the year that a club can do one of three things with. It could make capital investment, it can pay down debt, or it can increase reserves, which we've talked about on the webinar already. We believe that the net available capital ratio, which is that amount of money divided by the operating revenue, should be 18% or higher, ideally for every club. You can see 70% of the clubs are less than that threshold. If that ratio is 10% or under, we refer to the club as capital stopped. And those are the clubs that have weak balance sheets. If the ratio is between 10 to 18%, those are the clubs with average balance sheets or moderate balance sheets. And obviously, depending on where you fall in that range, it goes from weak to strong. And then finally, clubs with the ratio, and it's a persistent ratio, by the way, this ratio changes year in and year out especially if you rely on assessments, and that's why we're not a fan of them. Uh, but those are the clubs that we refer to as capital rich, okay? Critical measure, critical metric, every club needs to understand it. We will tell, we'll help any club understand what that, how to calculate it and, and understand what it is and what it means. Any club, whether you subscribe or don't. I know because I've interfaced with them, experienced them, I've been in boardrooms with them. There are some folks on the call who are probably board members who are, could, could dismiss some of what I'm saying now, that the operating ledge is not a financial driver. I wanted to spell that because it's incorrect, okay? It's critical that we embrace the capital ledger as the financial driver and the operating ledger as the vehicle for delivering services and amenities and the member experience. That's critical because that's the way the industry works, period. It's not our opinion. It's what the data shows. It's what the industry has been doing for years. Clubs that have weak balance sheets, clubs that have weak membership engines do not have an operating problem. They have a capital problem. And it's the capital problem that led to the weak member experience and the weak membership engine. This chart shows the sources of a net available capital for all the clubs in our database from last year's results. That blue slice, if you look across all of the clubs, the average, the blue slice is the contribution to capital emanating from the operating ledger. It's a paltry 2%. It won't change anyone's future. And by the way, if your club is generating a significant proportion of its capital available from, the operating, from an operating surplus, I would contend respectfully but passionately that you have a head fake. I'm an old hockey player, okay? It's a head fake. If you're doing that, all you're doing, if you take dues in from your members, and you restrict the use of some of those dues from delivering the member experience on the operating ledger, all you've done is said, we're charging you capital dues, which is not calling it that. Any dues that are destined for the bottom line of the operating ledger are in effect capital dues. We believe they should be segregated, that the owners of the club should know what they're contributing in terms of operating and what they're contributing in terms of capital. We think that's necessary. We've talked about this before. Every family business organization needs net worth to grow over time. Based on what we just learned, the only way a club's increasing its net worth over time is if it has enough capital income to overcome the depreciation that was excluded from the operating ledger. If it does, the net worth will go up. If it doesn't, the net worth will go down. Half of the club, since we went to, we've gathered the data, we got over 600 clubs on this chart now. We've gathered the net worth of members' equity for every single year 
since 2006. Every year, 600 clubs. It's a lot of work. We're about to do it for another 1,500 clubs. We went and decided to get 2006 for a reason, because it was before the last meltdown. Half of the clubs in this, in this database have a net worth that is less today than it was in 2006, if you consider inflation. Obviously, we have to grow net worth at greater than the rate of inflation. We, in the white paper, broke the industry into four buckets. There's a lot more data there. I'm just going to speak to it. Four quartiles. A quarter of the clubs have a net worth that is shrinking, meaning their club's shrinking. It's growing at negative 1% or less. If you're in that bucket, you have a critical situation, and it must be arrested immediately. If it isn't arrested soon, it's inevitable that your club will be closing its doors, period. That should be black. It, it, it shows red. The, the 25th percentile of the median is a, is a minus 1% decline to a 2.2%. This is a compounded annual growth rate increase. Those clubs are still shrinking. They're just shrinking in inflation adjusted dollars. It's still a crisis. It's just a slow motion crisis. You have a little bit more time, but you got to get the net worth growing. So that's just half the industry, half the industry shrinking. The clubs that are between the median and the 75th percentile, between 2.2% and 5% are generating nearly enough capital to meet their obligatory capital needs. And the clubs that are in the upper quartile, that quarter of the industry that's capital rich, which is the quarter of the industry with the high initiation fees, which is the quarter of the industry with the strong membership engine, which is the quarter of the industry with the wait list, which is the quarter of the industry with the compelling member experience. These things are all tied together. Those are the clubs that can meet both obligatory and aspirational capital needs. And aspirational means they can grow their assets, add to the services and amenities, expand the asset base, not have just one resort style pool, but three. I can't overstate the importance of a club knowing exactly what its net worth over time is doing. We came upon that concept through hard work. We enunciated the concept, and that concept never existed before, and it's the most important thing this industry has to embrace. I've had the fortune, frankly, I love finance, but I'm not a financial guru. I've had a couple of Fortune 500 CFOs during board presentations I did at their club come up to me after presenting the net worth over time concept and then telling me how profound it was and how it changed their view of their club and their club from a financial standpoint. And we have to tie it to the balance sheet. It goes right back to the, to the I'm building a big circle of logic here, right back to the beginning of the webinar. Some clubs entered this crisis with a weak balance sheet, some clubs entered it with the average balance sheet, and some clubs entered it with the strong balance sheet. Same with families, people, and other businesses. I know which one I'd rather enter it with. But when you look at the three types of clubs, so the strong club in this case is a real club, and the weak club is a real club. The average club is just the average of the clubs that are in the middle of the industry, between the 25th and the 75th percentile. Look at the strong club's net worth CAGR over time, 5.7%, up a quartile of the industry. Look at the average club, 2.2%. Look at the weak club, it's declining at 15% a year. 20 years ago, by the way, that club, that weak club, if, you made, if we made a list of the top 50 to 100 legacy clubs in this United States or North America, for that matter, some of the great legacy clubs in Canada, this club's on that list. 20 years later, they're about to go out of business. Sad part is they still haven't embraced the data to make decisions. Amazing to me. But what happens is if your member's equity is increasing, then that forms the strength of your balance sheet. The, the strong club has member's equity accounting for 90% of the money that's accrued over time. The average club member's equity is 70% and 
In the wheat club, it's 10%. The wheat club has leaned more on asking banks for money to fund capital than their own members. The liability section of a balance sheet in a club is basically bank debt. The wheat club doesn't call the owners in and say, hey, we got to cough up money for capital. They go to a bank because it's easier. We got to stop that. And all you have to do is look at the debt to equity ratio and you, this, the story is told. But there's a thing on the left side of the balance sheet which is critical, which is all three of these clubs, but for the strong club because of their cash reserves, they do have enough cash. They have a capital, uh, restricted cash for capital reserves, which, which if you take the cash and you take the proportion of assets that are in net property, plant, and equipment, they're always going to end up about 90% for any club. It's just a trade-off. You can see across these three clubs, they're all just basically 90%. Um, the point of this is that members' equity flows into assets, net book value of property, plant, and equipment. That's what happens with members' equity. It comes into the club first as money via capital income. It increases members' equity from a financial and accounting standpoint, and then it's eventually destined to be invested in the physical assets of the club. That's the sustainable financial model of clubs. All that operating money, consumed every year. Doesn't persist, it's consumed by members enjoying the club. We also discovered the net to gross property plant and equipment ratio. It's simply saying, take the after depreciated, accumulated depreciation value of your assets and divide it by what you paid for them. The ratio is gonna fall somewhere between zero and 100%. This shows, again, over 600 clubs. The median club has a net to gross property plant and equipment ratio of 46%. That means the average club has an asset base that's about halfway through its depreciated life. The 25th percentile is 36. The 75th percentile, which we also believe and recommend is the target for every club, is 55%. Look at the net to gross PP&E ratio for the strong balance sheet club, 65%. So they not only have a strong financial balance sheet, they have a strong real balance sheet because the wheat club, the deferred maintenance didn't show up until we coined the net to gross property plant and equipment ratio. I've seen clubs that have reasonable financial balance sheets, but they have a 20% net to gross PP&E ratio, which is nothing more than debt. It's deferred maintenance on assets. It's not debt that's owed to the bank. It's debt that's owned from the owners of the club to the club to reinvest in the asset base. Look at what happens to the initiation fee in the four buckets, the four quartiles. In the clubs that are in the lower quartile on this ratio, the median initiation fee is 10 grand. In the clubs in the upper quartile, the median initiation fee is 40 grand. It reflects the value proposition of the club. Who wants to join a club that when you walk in it has holes in the carpet or potholes in the parking lot or holes in the roof? Those are all real things. I've seen all of them in clubs. We give clubs. Anything less than a 40% ratio, we give a red flag. Anything from 40 to 55, we give a yellow flag. And anything over 55, we give a green flag. Only a quarter of the clubs are over our recommended target. Three quarters are under. Obviously, the further under, the bigger the issue. There's two types of capital that exist. Obligatory, which is repair and replacement of the assets we own, and aspirational, which is expanding or adding to the asset base. At my club, we don't have a pool right now. If we put a pool in, that would be aspirational. At my club, it's a golf club, we're installing a new irrigation system. That's an obligatory investment. We believe that clubs need to have recurring capital dues from the owner slash members in a manner that allows them to, to meet their future obligatory needs, not assessments recurring capital dues, and we believe that the source of aspirational money 
is the initiation fee income and potentially debt. The worst thing a club can do is use debt to do obligatory investment because all we've done is shift the burden for that money from the people who consumed it, the older members, to the future member because they're going to pay the debt back. The key to this whole thing, and for all the clubs, and it's three-quarters of the clubs on this call and three-quarters of the clubs in the industry, the key to success in a club and what we should be doing after we emerge from the crisis, if we embrace the, be embrace the best financial practices, is creating a forward-looking capital plan that assures the club has the ability to meet its forward-looking capital needs. It's that simple. And if we have that plan and we implement that plan and we get the members slash owners to support that plan, we will have growing net worth because net worth over time is ultimately a leading indicator of a club's ability to meet its future capital needs. Okay, finally, I'm on the last point. Not finally, I could keep going, but I can't because everyone has something else to do. There's one more point in this. Five best financial practices. This is new data. I don't think it's ever been seen, except in a couple of boardrooms where we've shown it. This is uh, for all clubs, not just golf clubs. The point is this. Clubs compete on value, not price. And this chart demonstrates that, I think, conclusively. Look at the member count and look at the dues as the initiation fee increases. So clubs with higher initiation fees also have higher dues and more members. Clubs with lower initiation fees have less members and lower dues. Those clubs on the on the left in the lower quartile with the initiation fee of 7,500 or under and the dues of 48 or 900 or under do not have enough members and enough money to fund a compelling member experience. That's why their initiation fee is low. This is where we plead. They dropped the initiation fee, those clubs, since the last recession, most of them. It didn't solve their problem. All it did is restrict the amount of capital they had to reinvest. It was a wrong decision. The upper quartile is the group of the industry that's been increasing the initiation fee consistently since the last recession, and they also increased the dues consistently, and they also invest and increase the member experience consistently such that it's relevant for today. We're in the third decade of the 21st century. The crisis will be in our rearview mirror at some point in the near future. It might not be in three weeks or three months, but it will be. And when it is, we have to embrace the best financial practices. And here's one more view of this. This data came as a result of a great discussion I had in a board presentation where one of the board members took umbrage and I was completely acceptable of that. I made a point, which is, Lower expenses is not good in the club industry and higher expenses are. We don't want to cut expenses. We want to increase expenses. Every business that's growing is not only growing revenue, they're growing their expenses. Ideally, the expenses grow at a slower rate than the revenue. That's ideal. But you can't have one without the other. So I, and after I left that meeting, I thought, I got to do a better job of quantifying what I just said. So here's the quantification of it. This just shows the total operating expenses of all the club's 2019 data in our database. The median, which we'd expect, seven, and it's both golf and non-golf, 7.4 million, 25th percentile, 4.7 million, 75th percentile, 10.5 million. Look at the initiation fee the full member equivalents, and the full member dues. The point is, increasing expenses does not mean we're being inefficient. It means we're growing the member experience. The more money we spend on the member experience, 
the more compelling the member experience, the more compelling the member experience, the more members want to join, the more members want to join, the higher the initiation fee goes. It's a very logical, tight cause and effect. And the data demonstrates that it's tight. Cutting expenses in or after this crisis will lead clubs astray, period. In summation, we have to take away and we have to consider while we're in the midst of this crisis that operating money is not the financial driver in a club. It's the member experience. It's the money we have to fund the member experience. If we don't have enough of it, then we the member experience will decline. It's capital money that's the money that drives the financial outcome in a club, which we've seen throughout the webinar. It also increases members' equity and allows us to invest properly and properly plant and equipment. If we don't gather enough capital, then the net worth will decline, the footprint won't expand, and the assets will become depleted and irrelevant. And I'm getting to the end. I'm sorry it ran a little over. Obviously, first time I've done this webinar, so I wasn't sure on timing, but close. This all goes hand in hand, and one of our team members said to me about a week ago, I thought it was right on the money. I hope the crisis doesn't drive boards into operational governance, and boy, do we ever hope that. We have just gone through for 90 minutes a whole ream of data and insight that indicates we have to be strategic. We have to think about the member experience. We have to be forward-looking. We have to consider capital as the financial driver. We have to understand the operating ledgers, the member experience. We're not out to hack and flash the budgets because of the crisis. That'll lead us in the wrong direction. We have to consider it strategically. From whence did we come? Why are we there? And how do we change our bucket looking forward? And in the end, it's all about relevance. I put on one of the slides, I skipped it. In the white paper, I did the research. It's a great way to look at it. Since 2006, the same time period as the clubs we looked at, Amazon's compounded annual growth rate of stockholders' equity was 47%. Why did I not buy that stock? Macy's compounded annual growth rate of, mem of stockholders' equity is a decline of 6%. Which company is relevant in 2020? During this crisis, Amazon's hiring 100,000 people to keep up with the demand. You know what Macy's did? They furloughed everyone. The crisis exposed one company's weak business model and illuminated the strength of the other companies, Amazon's. So in the end, a long circle, but we're back to where we came from. Please don't make decisions that have long-term consequences with short-term information and while we're under the stress of the crisis. Don't be hacking away at budgets. Don't be cutting initiation fees. Don't be cutting dues. Please don't do it. Through the end of April, it's a month away, we're in a tactical situation, and all we should do is really focus on managing the short-term shutdown. In May through June, we'll know where we're at with the virus. If you participate in the strategic monthly dashboard, you're going to have visibility into what's going on in the market. You'll have visibility into how your membership trends are in relation to your local market and the industry at large. Critical data. And then finally, once we get through that middle of the year and things are really coming back to normal, hopefully. And whether it does, it doesn't, by the way. It's not going to change the best practices. The best practices will remain. They've been there forever. It just took a long time to discover them. But embrace the best practices we just looked at and create the future by creating the forward-looking capital plan, a real one. I've looked at them from hundreds of clubs. Most of them, frankly, a back-of-the-envelope, arm-waving, wing-it assessments. Forward-looking capital plans done right, a comprehensive, precise, 
and will tell a club exactly what money it needs to meet the future. And then finally, I know there's a, a number of board members on this call. I beg you, all of you, do not let this crisis drag you into operational governance. Use it to move into strategic governance. It's an opportunity. And with that, I'm finished. And if there's questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, I actually think, Ray, you've covered uh, you've you've covered most of what we had here. And I think since we're uh, ten minutes over, that I told people that we'd follow up by email if that's okay. Sure, that's good by me. Okay. All right. So thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, everyone. Us. We hope everyone's well, and uh, we'll all, as they, as we've been saying, it's the watchword. We'll all get through this together. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Terry.